Hey nerds, long time no fuck around. Uh, to any uh, of you who are watching me on YouTube, you may see that I have a sick ass new backdrop. Backdrop? Backdrop. Which, I mean, there's a corner over here that I can't get the camera angle to get me like I'm looking at you good and also not get that little corner out. And I simply haven't the I, I don't have the patience to keep fucking with it so just like don't look at it and and if you look at it I swear to god I will shit inside of you do you understand that don't fucking look at it okay all right eyes here so I thought anyhow been a bit of a rough month um it's none of your fucking business in what manner, but for one, my back went out for like two weeks. I, I dared to sit on the floor for the duration of Milo and Otis, and much to my uh, hurt, very hurt pride, following that film, I was unable to walk for about two weeks. Excruciating pain. You wouldn't believe. And, uh, and then I've also been terribly ill for... About the last two weeks. Yeah, that too. Like, as soon as my back got better, my lungs got fucky. And I cannot wait for the season to change, and hopefully I will stop getting sick constantly. But I straight up haven't had much of a voice for the last several days. I've had this mostly ready. I was able to finish the final touches and such on it within about four hours today. And I could have done that at any time, but I didn't have a voice, and I knew that as soon as I got it done, I was going to be all gung-ho about it, and I wanted, I would want to record it right off. So, sorry about that. I guess it's... What if I released, like, three episodes in the last, like, five, five six months? Is that about where I'm at? Jeeshish. Jeeshish. <laughs> I, I stream on Twitch sometimes. If you just want to look at my dumb head, but usually I'm playing Overwatch, so I'm like really invested in it and can't really talk all that much. I think I might still be funny anyway. I've got some good insults. Uh, well, yeah. Anyway, so that's my life updates that, that I'm willing to share. Um, how 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 are you doing? How's it how's it hanging? Hey, nerds. Long time no fuck around. Uh, to any uh, of you who are watching me on YouTube, you may see that I have a sick ass new backdrop. Backdrop? Backdrop. Which, I mean, there's a corner over here that I can't get the camera angle to get me like I'm looking at you good and also not get that little corner out. And I simply haven't the. I. I don't have the patience to keep fucking with it so just like don't look at it and and if you look at it I swear to god I will shit inside of you do you understand that don't fucking look at it okay all right eyes here so I thought anyhow been a bit of a rough month um it's none of your fucking business in what manner, but for one, my back went out for like two weeks. I, I dared to sit on the floor for the duration of Milo and Otis, and much to my uh, hurt, very hurt pride, following that film, I was unable to walk for about two weeks. Excruciating pain. You wouldn't believe. And, uh, and then I've also been terribly ill for... About the last two weeks. Yeah, that too. Like, as soon as my back got better, my lungs got fucky. And I cannot wait for the season to change, and hopefully I will stop getting sick constantly. But I straight up haven't had much of a voice for the last several days. I've had this mostly ready. I was able to finish the final touches and such on it within about four hours today. And I could have done that at any time, but I didn't have a voice, and I knew that as soon as I got it done, I was going to be all gung-ho about it, and I wanted, I would want to record it right off. So, sorry about that. I guess it's... 
what have I released like three episodes in the last like five five six months is that about where I'm at G shish G shish <laughs> I, I stream on twitch sometimes if you just want to look at my dumb head but usually I'm playing overwatch so I'm like really invested in it and can't really talk all that much I think I might still be funny anyway I've got some good insults uh well yeah anyway so that's my life updates that I'm willing to share. Um, how, how, how are you doing? How's it, how's it hanging? Let's do that thing that you're not supposed to do at family dinner, but you should do anyway because it's funny when you upset people, especially if they can't escape you. Let's talk about religion. <laughs> well, historically, it has been a keystone of many religions, both pagan and Abrahamic, that the mortal body is inherently tethered to the soul, and the afterlife is affected in certain ways based on what is done with the body during life. Did I say although? You know what I mean. An example being how in Mormonism, it's forbidden to consume alcohol, drugs, even caffeine, because God made the body perfect, and by putting chemicals into it, you're desecrating his perfect work. It's a, a sign. It's a sin. It's a sign. <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> I've been desecrated. <laughs> it's a sin. You're going to hell. You do not pass go. This is similar to the belief that should one's body finally fail to the treacheries of this wretched world, it should be whole so that the soul can get into the afterlife. It's as if there's a belief that by leaving behind or discarding, if you will, a piece of your body, which is perfectly made by the sculpting hands of the omnipotent creator, you are disrespecting them and denying the gift that was given to you. <clears throat> you see, I feel like people in general have never taken this so seriously or technically, like, as a whole. Because, can you imagine, imagine, say, a holy man, a priest perhaps, loses his arm to an infection... I could have sworn I'd put that bitch on silent. Did you just hear my phone go off? <sighs> okay. Holy man, a priest, loses his arm to an infection in the year 834 AD. And everyone tells him, well, sucks to suck, have fun in hell. Are you fucking serious? I, I'd put it on silent for sure now. If that go if it goes off again, someone kick my ass because apparently I don't know how to do anything. But come on, okay, okay, yeah. Anyway, you, you can't imagine that people would be like, "Haha, you lost your arm. Now you can't get into heaven." Blah blah blah. You know, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like possible. You know. However. The difference may lie in the elective nature of some cases, such as if he intentionally cut his own arm off. That might be different, right? The intention may be what makes the difference in whether or not the lack of a body part is a sin. You know? Do you think that if you lose your arm in life through no fault of your own, you get it back in the other world? Or is it just gone and when you die your soul is now, like, without a head? without a head if you lose it, or an arm if you lose it. And like, how your body is in death is how your soul is forever. I feel like there are a whole lot of different ideas about the ways in which souls or spirits take form. I've seen, mostly in films, times when people die and their spirit ends up looking as they did when they were children, for example. And then other times, Someone dies all old and haggard and gnarly looking, and the ghost ends up looking just like that, and it's terrifying, terrifying, even if they're a cool chap, because, like, they appear to someone and they're like, ah, rah, rah, and, like, he could just be being like, bro, I got extra cake in the other room. Oh, shit, no, I don't. That was 200 years ago. But he, he just looks like that, so he's scary, you know? <laughs> If you believe that upon death, your soul gets its arm back, would you also say that the soul gets an organ back? Should that have been removed during life? Will I get my wisdom teeth back? Will people get their tonsils returned to them in the afterlife? Furthermore, 
I posit the question. Is it a sin to have your tonsils removed in order to work in Antarctica, given that they are not giving you the itis? That would technically be self-mutilation, wouldn't it? Would that be a sin? That is aside the point, <laughs> but still somewhat related, I suppose. I'm getting all philosophical here about shit I don't even believe in. I'm a curious bitch, what can I say? Curious and sexy. On the opposite side of this quandary, there is a belief that in death, some part of the soul continues to exist within any body part that remains on the earthly plane. It's as if uh, the body part was not properly interred or destroyed, if that's what you're into. Um, the soul of the person cannot fully move on to their afterlife. I'm not sure if normal people think about this as much as I do, but due to my being a chronic spooky nerd, I think about it a lot without even realizing it. For example, I swear one of these days I'll, I'll make it through two episodes without mentioning this. But y you know how in Supernatural, <laughs> when they're dealing with a haunting, they look for the body and burn it? And sometimes they burn the body but find that the ghost is still there. So they have to go find the hair in the wall or something, or, or the mummified hand because that still technically remains and the ghost is still attached to it. So some people believe that even something so small as a lock of hair could keep a spirit on earth doing weird shit. Side note, just the other day, I learned about some haunted dolls, and let me tell you, that shit is terrifying. I've always been scared of dolls, to be honest, uh, probably because I, my sister's a bitch and she made me watch Chucky when I was far too young to observe such a such a horrible, horrible thing. I still hate Chucky. I don't care. I don't even care. But they, they used to make them with real human hair. And even in the likeness of real living or recently deceased children, sometimes with the hair of those actual human children. And hell no. Hell no. If anything is haunted, it's that doll with real human hair. I don't even give a fuck. I'm a skeptic 99% of the time, but I will not be fucking with that weird little bitch. You keep it in the cupboard, or you, you burn it. Burn, why is that still there? Fuck history in this one instance. <laughs> Jeebus. Also, <laughs> because of the attachment to the soul, to small pieces of the body following death, do you think the Tooth Fairy is living in a world of nightmares, haunted by the yearning souls of those whose teeth she took when they were children? Or do you think she uses the teeth of those people to capture and enslave souls when they die, like the teeth are some sort of insurance that she will have that soul later on? Are we all screwed? Are we all screwed? Are we all destined to be tied in vengeance or in servitude to a fae? Honestly, we all probably are anyway, for a variety of reasons. I bet best to just accept it, I suppose. You know, like that's gonna happen. Uh, whether it's the Tooth Fairy or some other weird shit, I just, I, you know, I give up. <laughs> a cursory search across the land of the internet brought up a whole lot of interesting stories about individuals who have had strange experiences following an organ transplant. Most of them only exist as very brief and vague blurbs in, like, listicles. <laughs> listicles. <laughs> that sounds weird to me. Uh, because of testicles. Yeah. Uh, articles posted in list form. Uh, some of them, I was able to find mo multiple postings that said the same few short sentences about these people. So I really cannot definitively say these stories are true. And I won't use any names on these stories just in case there's some ridiculous, potentially harmful misinformation going around about these very real people. You know, I'm not going to be that guy. I just can't find enough verifiable information about these cases to feel comfortable putting people's names out there, you know? The spookiest one of the stories that I found was the case of a fella who was suffering from congestive heart failure. This was in the year 1995, supposedly. 
Hopefully you have an idea of how long people end up stuck on the waiting list for a transplant even today. So back in the 90s, he had to have been on that wait list for fucking ever. And I'll leave some links in the description to give you some statistics on organ donation and the waiting times and such at the end of the episode. Or at least I'll tell you about it. Uh, remind me. Don't let me forget. Anyway, our protagonist was sitting there with a failing heart for fucking ever and finally was able to be matched with an available heart to transplant into his meat suit. As you may expect, he was extremely grateful to receive the heart, um, and when he was recovered, the feelings of gratitude prompted him to reach out to the family of the donor to thank them. This is something that happens surprisingly often, even though there's, like, this confidentiality and anonymity, and an anonymity, they keep, they keep the donors anonymous from the receivers, um, <laughs> generally, because it helps to prevent people reaching out and being weird, causing psychological trauma, whatever. Usually they don't do that, but it does happen pretty often in cases where behavior is weird. Anyway, as far as this story goes, uh, like, and, and in the case of this story, possibly if it's true, reaching out to the family can help alleviate feelings of guilt that the recipient may have, knowing that they live because someone else no longer does, and it also just lets them say thank you and let people know how much they appreciate that their loved one has helped them stay alive. This does have mixed results with the families of the donors. Um, sometimes they love it. They like to see that their loved one's sacrifice wasn't in vain, and even though they're gone, they've helped give someone else a second chance, blah blah blah. <laughs> Conversely, it can be very fucking rough to look at someone and know that your fucking son's still beating heart is inside of their body and your damn kid is dead. So, yeah, that, that's kind of a lot to handle for some people. Which is why they don't usually allow you to contact your donor <laughs> or their family. Anyway, tangent aside, this guy wrote some letters to the family of his donor and they were receptive to the whole thing. They were happy to hear from him, and they continued communications with him, which eventually led to him meeting the family in person. And after speaking with the family, he learned that the man who once owned his heart was a man in his 30s who had committed slip and slide. He had used a firearm to give himself the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Sorry, I'm trying really hard to avoid using the actual word for that because it, like, it's triggering, you know? I don't, yeah. It's a little rough, but but I'm not sure if it helps much if I'm still painting the photo, like the picture of it, the like the clear image of it happening in your brain. Let me know if it helps or if I should just fucking say the word. I don't know anymore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the big sleep with the firearm. That's what his donor had done. Personally. If that's the case, I'm very impressed that he was found soon enough for his heart to still be viable. You know what? It's a story. Just enjoy it. Don't be a me about it and ask too many questions. So he gets close with this guy's loved ones, and he meets his widow, who was a few years younger in her late 20s. As the story goes, our hero and the widow felt an immediate deep connection between each other and quickly fell in love. Eventually, the two of them got married and lived happily ever after. Got themselves a little picket fence and co-parented the six children that they each had with their... Well, they had combined from their previous marriages. One moment, I must cough. <coughs> Very good. So they had six kids combined. Which means that he was raising the kids of the guy whose heart he had... Woo! And I feel like that would be really weird. Wouldn't that be weird? Like, if I were one of the kids, I would be super weirded out. I would freak out a little bit. If my mom married a guy who had my dad's heart in him, but it wasn't my dad. I don't know. That's just a lot to me. That's a concept. That's a whole concept in its own. Twelve years into their happy relationship following the transplant, our protagonist made a notable choice for himself. Uh, let's just say that his body was found with the same wounds that his donor had. He had taken himself the merciless snooze. 
using the very same method that his donor had all those years ago. Isn't, isn't that spooky? <laughs> So, another story that I can't verify presents some interesting possibilities if it is indeed true. I don't even have enough information about this one to tell it like a proper tale, but I think it's neat to mention. Supposedly, supposedly, wow, all the stupid sounds. I even waited for the dryer to stop before I started recording, and yet everything is, is everything's against me trying to trying to fuck me up and i can't i personally can't stop looking at that corner of the screen that's showing the carpet i can't no yes i've had enough i've had enough i'm just going to start talking through my coughing i'm going to talk through every notification and i'm going to place a curse on that corner of my screen anyway this story. Supposedly, there was a 15-year-old girl whose liver started throwing a fit, like they do sometimes, and she ended up needing a transplant. Her body accepted the foreign organ without any issues and had no real need for anti-rejection drugs, which is basically a miracle, if you, if you ask me. Hiccups now? God. I'm doing my best here, boys. <laughs> but the strangest thing and why she did not need to take those very standard drugs is that upon the transplant, her body adopted the immune system and blood type of her donor. It is said that nine months after the operation, during a checkup, her doctors saw that her blood type had changed from O positive to type O negative. See, see what I did there? You know, I, I listened to that, the song Black Number One by typo negative over and over almost every day for years straight. And I always thought that it says that he says you can't go out cause your boobs are showing. I just assumed that like this goth girl wasn't allowed to go out cause her parents were like, no, you fucking cover that chest up, bitch. You little, but no, no, it wasn't until last year that I finally heard it. And I looked it up, and it's he's saying, you can't go out because your roots are showing. Like she's just embarrassed because she hasn't dyed her hair black. Black number one in a long time. I'm the worst goth. I didn't even know the words to like one of the most popular typo negative songs. It's embarrassing. It really is. I, I still think it's funny. I still say boobs when I sing along with it, though, because it's funny to me. I heard somewhere that Peter Steele was a Nazi. Is that true? It's disappointing. It's disappointing if so. Like, I mean, he's dead, right? So I can't, like, it's not going to be, he's not going to get any money from me listening to it, is he? I should just pirate it anyway. Like, I'm still obviously going to listen to Typo Negative. I don't want to give anyone any money about it if they were Nazis. You know what I mean? Oh, tangent. Anyway, I have another story, and it's really, really funny. I actually have two more. Uh, this one is, is it's more funny than spooky. Um, it just tickles my fancy. Behold, the pettiest tale in all of organ transplant lore. The tale of a doctor from Long Island. The whispers say that his wife was in need of a kidney transplant, and because chivalry is not dead, he underwent the ultimate sacrifice to save the life of his beloved. True fucking... Sh not Shakespeare. I mean, kind of. No, true old-school romantic type shit. He gave her his kidney to save her life. Shortly after the surgery, however, she served him with divorce papers. The doctor sued her and demanded that she give his kidney back. That or she pay him $1.5 million for said kidney. <laughs> and everyone told him that they can't really do that for 
a slew of reasons, but God damn it, he tried. And that, <laughs> that's hilarious to me. From what I read, there was like a whole bunch of like complicated details, like him having paranoid delusions or, and or her cheating on him and stuff like that leading to the pettiness, but I don't think that's relevant. All, all we need to know is that he gave her his kidney and then he sued her to get it back and they were like, we, we can't, we can't untransplant an organ. That's insane. You're insane. And that's just so fucking funny to me. <laughs> I hope that's true. It seems, it seems like something that would happen though, right? That seems probable, even if the details are different. I, I, I believe it could happen. <laughs> okay. And so... This one, this story is actually like the biggest one and the most important one to the, to the cause. And it, it's actually super interesting. And I really wish that I had been able to get on my, get my, get my hands on the actual book that I'm going to reference. I'll tell you a little bit about it. I'll leave it, um, in the references too, because it's, it's interesting. Uh, not as much the story itself that interests me but the perspective of our protagonist and her philosophical uh, waxing that she does. Anyway, this is the story of Claire Sylvia. Possibly the most infamous case of strange happenings following an organ transplant can be found in the story of a woman named Claire Sylvia. And her story is why it's so incredibly important to do your research properly and not just believe the first thing that you see on the internet. <laughs> Seriously. The first place that I came upon while searching for stories on the subject sent me to one of those jank-ass, no-reference-list-having websites that gave me a little paragraph about her. And when I dug for her name afterward, I found that the entire paragraph on that first website was like, 90% incorrect. Got the location on the wrong side of the planet. The year was 15 years off. You know, like... <laughs> so if you find something interesting on the internet, type some keywords from it into another search and read some more about it before you tell anyone. Because can you fucking imagine if my nerd ass just told you this story with all of those incorrect details? I would die in shame. I would never forgive myself once I found out. That's a fucking nightmare to me. <laughs> That's worse than shitting my pants while driving to work. Which, which to be fair, I have done quite a bit. And it's, it's really not that bad. You develop a system after, after it happens once or twice, you know, and it becomes easier to deal with. So like, don't be ashamed of pooping your pants if that happens. Because uh, I, I do it all the time. And I'm, like, really hot. So, like, obviously it's fine. Claire Sylvia. <laughs> like I said, her experience is one of the most well-documented concerning behavioral and spiritual changes following an organ transplant. She was always very outspoken about what she was experiencing, and it drew everyone's attention to her great question, where does the body end and the soul begin? In 1988, Sylvia was in need of a heart and lung transplant. The operation was done at Yale, and really, kudos to those healthcare professionals, because at the time, the procedure was still being refined. And uh, she claimed that following the transplant, Huge aspects of her personality changed, and drastically. She had been a classical dancer, and so all her life she had been incredibly health conscious, you know? She had a very disciplined eating regimen and diet that she stuck to. Her favorite colors were pink and shades of green. Like, from what I can tell, she was sort of a feminine stereotype. Like, not to be rude or whatever, but that's how she's described. And, like, if you know what I mean. Never touched alcohol, loved to dance, very elegant in her demeanor, heterosexual. About five months after her transplant, she began to have a very, very strange and vivid dreams. 
I was unable to find the details of these dreams, but she claims that within them were recurring concepts and clues that allowed her to learn about the man whose organs she had received. Along with these strange dreams, she finds that some of her preferences and tastes had begun to change. Not little things such as realizing she suddenly likes chocolate ice cream just as much as strawberry, you know? Big, drastic changes, like huge, noticeable to everyone around her, and especially herself. She developed powerful cravings for foods that she had never touched because of her strict diet, and frankly, that she had always found disgusting anyway. Most notably, she began to crave the taste of beer and McDonald's chicken nuggets, <laughs> of all things. And her preference for pinks and greens also changed, and she found herself more drawn to the color blue and shades of blue. And she even found herself suddenly attracted to other women. Her new organs straight up made her gay. And so she claims, you know, this was the 80s and early 90s. And we all know how being gay was at the time. And I don't want to open up a can of worms by saying it, but it may have been helpful to have some inexplicable, possibly mystical explanation for homosexual attraction at that time, you know? If it was something that you were going to present to people and talk about, and saying it's ghosts might be, <laughs> might have been a safe, a safe bet considering the time. You know what I mean, if you don't look it up. Actually, that's important. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you definitely do look it up. Serious problem. Bad times. Bad times for the queer community then. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on. She started liking girls after her organ transplant, all right? And so she noticed these changes and she thought to herself that they were so incredibly out of character for her. She decided that to find some answers, she needed to reach out to the family of her donor. When she did, she learned that her heart and lungs came from an 18-year-old lad named Timothy Lamarande. I hope I pronounced that right, Lamarande, who had died in a motorcycle accident. Allegedly, he was found with a bag of chicken nuggets in his pocket, which sounds like something I would do. Die on a motorcycle with a, with a pocket full of nuggets. That is 100% a me thing to do. Good on you, Timmy. <laughs> Throughout the rest of her life, she dedicated her time to sharing her story and posing the questions of what truly holds the human soul. Could it be that by having this boy's organs inside of her, she had taken on a part of his soul? Was it possible that his spirit was now tied to her body, or even tied to her own soul? From what I can tell, Timothy's family was in support of her beliefs and found comfort in the thought that in some way he was still here on earth with them. Claire Sylvia died uh, 21 years after her transplant at the age of 69. <laughs> Don't laugh. 69. Don't laugh. This is a serious subject. In 1997, she published a book detailing her experiences and her spiritual journey since the operation. I was unable to find a free version of it, so I haven't got to read it myself. But if you're interested at all, I encourage finding it and giving it a read and then telling me all about it. I read a bunch of summaries and reviews, and I guess that's good enough for what I'm doing. But I still want to read it, read it. Um, and if you join, if you join my Patreon, it'll help me get, it'll help me get books and stuff that that I can read to um, make my understanding of the topics that I discuss more robust. And I like books but I don't make any money doing this, so I can't afford books for it. No, no, no big deal. The book is called A Change of Heart, A Memoir, like I said, by Claire Sylvia, published in 1997. I saw copies published in 1998, too. Anyway, if you search A Change of Heart, A Memoir, by Claire Sylvia, you should be able to find it pretty easy. I hope all of that was fun, because from here on out, we're getting stuffy and disappointing. Just how I like it. St stuff. I'm not going there. I'll try to keep it concise, though. I'm not a doctor of men. 
I am a doctor of space and demons. Yeah, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Defend me in my absence. <laughs> Coughing. So when it comes to organ transplants, information such as gender, age, cause of death, personal preferences, and such of the donor are not divulged to the recipients, mostly for psychological reasons, which I will get to later. Um, <laughs> documented cases in which the recipients are able to get in touch with the recipient's families are exceptions, and those exceptions are made because of mysterious behavioral symptoms that compel them as individuals, or it compels their care providers to breach the traditional donor-recipient anonymity. Most people who receive an organ transplant don't actually have any notable personality or behavioral changes following the surgery. According to a German specialist named Reiner Korf, worldwide there are about 3,500 heart transplants every year. If every one of them, and that's not including other organs, had these experiences, there would almost certainly be a strongly agreed upon explanation. According to the observations of American neuropsychologist Paul Pearsall, who is among the utmost authorities on the matter, heart transplant recipients are the most likely to experience personality changes. He noted that patients who had received liver or kidney transplants sometimes notice changes in sense of smell and food preferences, but rarely any other major differences in their behavior or anything else like that. In these people, the changes were largely temporary as well, and could be explained because of reactions to medications and other pretty standard factors regarding organ transplantation. People who got new hearts had a lot more strange things going on that could be more likely associated with the donor. More things changing about them that were, I don't know, had something to do with the donor's habits or preferences or their history. The procedure of transplanting organs is dependent on the belief of the human body like a machine. It only works in practice because, in a sense, the body is much like a fucking car. If the alternator goes out, replace it and the car will start right back up. So if your lungs are going out, if you can, just pop them out and slap a new one in there, you're good to go until your next oil change. Know what I'm saying? Much medical science requires this perspective on the human body, and it honestly fucking works. But it's so counterintuitive to what we want to believe, you know? We want to believe that we are more than a series of individual parts that can be swapped out when necessary. We like to think that there's more to us than that. A soul or some intangible force within us that makes us who we are, makes us individuals, makes us special. And that maybe when the machine breaks down, who we are won't necessarily just die with it. The heart has a huge, significant, symbolic association with identity, emotions, and the self. Why the fuck else would we hand each other paper hearts in February? It's just accepted that somehow, the heart is the emotional base of human beings. And within the heart is the essence of being mortal, being moral being good, just being human. Well, his heart was in the right place. Have a heart, you know? <laughs> like, It's considered the basis of the conscience, more so than the brain in many ways. In this way, there is a belief that the human soul rests in the heart. This gives the heart an interesting place in spirituality and medicine, because if you think of the body like a machine, then the heart is essentially just a pump just the thing that pumps the fluid through. But while it is certainly that, it is also metaphorically and spiritually the seat of the human soul. And that's sort of ingrained in us, at least in Western culture. Like I mentioned with all those sayings, like your heart being the basis of your morality and your compassion. You know, we don't, probably don't even think about it, but you know, let your heart guide you, you know? <laughs> because we consider the heart where the human soul sits. I wonder if that has something to do with something like chakras. 
like maybe this one's the big one and we feel that certain thing there. I haven't looked, I should study chakras. Anyway, symbolically, the heart represents the union of body and spirit. There is a theory that is often applied to this phenomena called the theory of inherited memory, which speculates that personality traits, tastes, and even memories are stored at a cellular level throughout the body rather than being solely based on the brain. So there is disagreement among not just scientists, but kind of like everybody, whether the self exists in the brain, the body as a whole, or in the soul. Is our identity because of the heart, or the brain, or the body as a whole? Or is who we are because of our soul, rather than any of our fleshy parts? The questions today. Tonight. <laughs> so, before someone is determined eligible for an organ transplant, they are given a psychiatric evaluation. These are generally used to help identify any psychological and psychosocial issues that may need to be addressed in order to prepare the candidate and their family for the process. This also helps to notice any psychiatric or social needs following the surgery. It allows the medical team to know what sort of personalized care will be necessary later, and it's important to know this shit so that they can recover effectively and also, just in case they have too many risk factors, to be sure it's a good idea for them to undergo the transplant at all. For example, uh, if they've got some serious brain issues, the feeling of guilt afterward could lead to things like... Yeah, like... The, in, the intentional forever nap, you know? And that needs to be noted beforehand. Transplant recipients and even candidates on the waiting list often experience a huge amount of psychological distress and are at a higher risk of developing psychiatric disorders. Rates of major depression range from 4 to 28 percent in liver trans transplant patients, 0 to 58 percent in heart transplant patients, and 0.4 to 20 percent among those receiving kidney transplants. Organ transplantation acts as an intense stressor and stimulus to which the body reacts with neurotransmitter and endocrine and meta endocrine and meta metabolic changes. Yeah, it fucks your whole body up. <laughs> the procedure essentially makes your endocrine system and your brain totally lose their shit. Like they freak the fuck out. The endocrine system is the series of glands throughout your body that produce hormones. As you may know, hormones have a very powerful effect on pretty much everything physical and psychological. They change the way your body burns or stores fat, the way your joints lube up or dry up and hurt you, whether or not you have any fucking patients in a crowded grocery store. I think I, uh, I talked about hormones a little bit in my episode about how <laughs> belch about how freezing to death is terrifying and the changes your body goes through when you're in intense cold that affects your endocrine system as well that and darkness but yeah it controls everything the endocrine system is a big fucking deal so following transplantation while the endocrine system is throwing its fit People experience biological, psychological, and even social reactions that can be severe. Like, it, can, uh, it can affect so much. It can affect your body. It can affect your brain. I don't know. That's a little redundant of me. I already said that. Uh, one major thing that it can cause is... Um, fucking... It can really massively affect your sense of identity, who you are, and that is in large part due to the hormonal changes following the transplant, and also, I actually don't have this written down, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk at you. Uh, another big reason for this is psychologically, even if it's unconscious or subconscious or whatever you want to call it, the part of your brain that that's not your main dialogue 
somewhere inside of yourself, you are aware that your body is now no longer 100% the body you were born with. And I really should have looked into if, uh, if this is a thing for people like amputees as well. If I have any amputee listeners, I would like to hear if, if that affects your sense of self. And then, like, there's also the psychological factors of uh, having been so sick that your body was shutting down. And, like, struggling with the back and forth of accepting death or accepting this this huge, um, what's the word, gesture of help from the universe or another person, your donor and your doctors, to prolong your life. That has huge psychological significance on people. And so, even if they don't have a background of psychiatric issues even if their hormone levels are, while they're going to be extreme no matter what, if they're, you know, in an unexpected range following the transplant, the psychological turmoil of all of that and experiencing that, and I imagine it's only worse the longer you're on the wait list, you know, uh, that can change the way you feel about yourself. That can change the way you feel about everything, but what's important right here is the sense of identity and the way that that changes following a transplant, you know? I feel like... I don't know how I would feel. I, I feel... I think I have friends who have had transplants. I don't know if you want to talk about it. If you do want to talk about it, please do. This is a cool conversation. And, and and I don't mean cool as in, hell yeah, awesome. I mean cool as in, like, there are these huge major experiences that some people experience in their life that a lot of other people never will. And in order to fully, or even try, but to, to dip your toe in, having a broader, fulfilled understanding of the human condition and what life is and can be and what humanity and being human and being alive is even about, I think that it's cool to share our stories. Like, I think it's cool to talk about shit that I've experienced that a lot of people never will. Like, even if the stories are fucking embarrassing or make people think less of me, I like to share those stories because... It helps, you know, helps broaden people's understanding of what life is and what can happen and what people can go through and what can, you know, they're cool stories, you know? I almost feel like an asshole even talking about this stuff, not having had a transplant myself. Or am I, or am I fucking exploiting it? Am I exploiting this really traumatic thing just to, for a chance to talk about ghosts? Uh, no, I'm probably all right. It's informative. I have sources. I'm not being a dick. If I am being a dick, let me know and I'll avoid stuff like this in the future. I'm probably just being harsh on myself. I got real, I got a little in my head there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> back to the rest of it. See, there are a lot of reasons, physical and psychological, biological and psychological, that people can experience behavioral changes and changes in their sense of self and identity following an organ transplant. That's where we were. This ordeal can be entirely positive, giving someone a new and improved sense of self and a more positive outlook on life like, because they've been saved. However, it can also cause severe emotional vulnerability and a negative body image disorders with self-presentation, paranoia, and even panic because somewhere in their heads they're aware that a foreign object is inside of them now. And these can be exasper exacerbated by immunosuppressive medications on top of the natural physical response. So it, immunosuppression uh, therapies and medicines are necessary following an organ transplant to ensure that the body doesn't attack and reject the new organ. Because, like, normally, if you get 
I'm trying to think of a really day-to-day example for anyone who might not know. Um, if you get like a sliver really, really deep in there, like real deep in your arm, so deep that you can't get it out with tweezers, your body will like attack it and be like, ah, foreign object, get that out of here. Our, our borders have been breached. And, and like, you know, push it out and fight off any infection it could be causing. And the same thing happens with the transplanted organ. Your body will be like, hell no. And that's part of why getting like the right blood type for um, an organ donor is so important. Because at least if it's the same blood type, like, it's less likely that your body's going to be like, attack, attack. You know, it's a big deal. It's very important. You, you, you need those immunosuppressant drugs, but those can also fuck with your head pretty nasty. It happens. <laughs> I do this with my face every time I accidentally click to record video before I click to record sound, so this is special just for all you video video followers. Mm-hmm. The sound the sa- the sound only listeners they they don't get this. It's all for you. <laughs> and now, I will list the most common beliefs concerning how and why these behavioral changes occur. Many people believe that the heart is the seat of the soul. As I mentioned earlier, and therefore, a new heart can bring new power and new life into the body, which changes the personality. There is also the belief in cellular memory. The cellular memory theory posits that we store our experiences, our memories, and aspects of our personality in the cells of our bodies. This means that when our cells are moved into someone else's body, they have some access to our memories and personal traits. Their neuropeptide theory. This one I I like a lot. I don't know enough about neuropeptides, um, but it it seems pretty rational to me. This one was proposed by pharmacologist Candace Pert, who claimed that neuropeptides stored in each cell act as a sort of biochemical parallel of emotion. Previously, it was believed that emotions existed exclusively within the limbic system of the brain, but Pert proposes that neuropeptides, which are a a protein-like messenger molecule that is released by the brain, that flow through the entire body, including the skeletal system, the endocrine system, the muscular system, even your booty fluids, uh, that they can carry emotions and such through every cell of our body. And this could potentially leave an almost like a residue, if that makes sense. Your body gets used to having that flow through you, so it's sort of imprinted on the organs and it flows through the new body when the organ is transplanted. Like a... Like how if you have a little bit of paint left on a paintbrush and you set it in a glass of water, and the water gets a little bit of paint in all of it. Kind of like that. Uh, Conversely, it could be ghosts. It could be ghosts. (laughs) Or... Uh, My favorite, and the most largely agreed upon, which isn't saying much because it's still very confusing, and as far as I can tell, there's no 100%, like, there's no consensus. There isn't a a large majority of psychiatrists, medical professionals of any sort, who have an agreement on this. But this one's like more agreed upon than others. <laughs> Is that the organs in our body are accustomed to processing a certain amount of certain hormones. And much like the neuropeptide theory, the organs remember their lifelong process with these hormones and the amounts of them. And it acts to adjust the hormones in the recipient to be more similar to those in the donor. Which makes a lot of sense because things like 
our preferences <laughs> is particularly notable. Um, our sexual preferences. Uh, that one's really obviously r rooted partially in our horm hormonal levels, you know? Um, even our preferences of color sometimes. It's like certain hormones can make us feel like a certain color is a little fucking irritating. I don't like a lot of orange, you know? Uh, uh, people don't like purple. Purple's my favorite color. That makes me feel calm. Some people think it's annoying. And our endocrine system and our hormones have a little bit to do with that. Another big one is food. Um, our food preferences. Cravings. Cravings for certain foods. That That's our hormones. So that would make a lot of sense if it was the hormones and the organs causing things like a change in food preferences, a change in color preferences, looking at a girl's butt and finding that quite nice for the first time, stuff like that is, could be explained if it had to do with the hormones from the organ, like doing stuff. And that's, that also ties in with how after a transplant, the endocrine system of the recipient's body is in fucking overdrive. It could just be pushing stuff through more. That's why I like that theory the most, anyway. So, there there are a bunch more. Um, in my in my sources, in my reference links, there are a whole lot of them. Uh, I'm not sure if it's obvious which ones say what, but if if you want to look at uh, other theories about why this happens, there will be a link in there somewhere. Um. So in conclusion, I have no conclusion actually. I think the hormone thing, but if that hasn't been like actually proven yet, you'd think that that would be relatively easy to prove, right? I imagine like we could just check the hormone levels in everyone and compare them. Like like if that were true, I feel like it would be more likely that there were some more solid evidence of it by now, at least readily available. I mean, because I couldn't find none. <laughs> but it seems to be that behavioral changes are due to hormonal changes caused by the introduction of an organ that is adapted to a different endocrine system. This means that it's probably not a haunted kidney and just some biology. On top of that, the psychological changes that follow an organ transplant, particularly the identity crisis and paranoia, could be causing these recipients to simply act out of character or even to imagine these changes or end up in a state of delusion. While this unfortunately makes sense of the spooky stories, it also feels like it's invalidating of people's experiences. Honestly, I feel like I'm brain shaming people by saying that. I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. I'm gaslighting these organ recipients. It's, it's the internet. I don't know. <laughs> I do my best here. <laughs> if these stories can be confirmed as true, and it is assumed that those who have told these stories are psychologically sound, then I have to admit that it does sound like ghosts. It sounds like it's ghosts. The behavioral changes, such as a, a change in sexuality or an interest in foods that they originally disliked, those are easily explained by hormonal adjustments following the procedure. Crazy dreams can also be explained by hormones, but the contents of those dreams not so much. Like, uh, Claire Sylvia said that she was dreaming about stuff that led her to being able to find the family of her donor. How, how could that, how could that happen? You know? Memories and visualizations brought on post-operation, if not the result of psychiatric complications, that also sounds like ghosts to me. 
So today on Back Alley Alchemist, we've decided that maybe ghosts, probably not ghosts, but, but definitely maybe ghosts this time, you know? <laughs> so currently there are more than 100,000 people on the waiting list for a life-saving organ transplant. I know I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be the guy. And I already told you how grueling it can be to be waiting around on that. Um, the perpetual uncertainty of whether you'll have a chance to keep living even just a while longer. Sometimes having to hope that someone dies so you can live longer. Like, that shit must really suck. Let's, uh, let's, I mean, if you're dead, you don't really, you don't really need your heart anymore, do you? And also, would it not be fun to haunt a new bestie and make them eat food they used to think was gross? Come on, that'd be hilarious. Like, what else are you gonna do? Unless you have some religious or spiritual reason not to sign up to be a donor, there aren't really any downsides. I used to always say that I refused to be an organ donor because I don't get to choose who gets it and I don't want to help save the life of an asshole. But honestly, that's just because I always forget and I think that it's funny to say. It makes me sound like a real asshole and I find that hilarious. Anyway... I think you can sign up at any time that you renew your ID or your license. So if you do that, you could save some little girl's life or something. I'm done preaching now. <laughs> this is a really good episode for follow-up questions. Let me know what you think. Do you think it's hormones, psychiatric disorders caused by the unbelievable stress of having the surgery, or do you think it's ghosts? I don't think I've ever been so genuinely interested in what you guys think. I mean, I'm always interested, but it's usually not something so, like... Like, I usually have a reasonable conclusion. I'm usually pretty convinced of, like, the explanation when I present it, you know? This one, I, I, I really do... Like, the jury's fucking out. The jury's out, nerds. <laughs> uh, so find me on other sites. Um, it's Back Alley Alchemist on YouTube and on the podcast platforms, and at Patreon. <laughs> um, it's Ali Alchemy 9000 on TikTok. I haven't been super active on there, but that's, that's, uh, sometimes I'll talk about spooky stuff, but usually it's just kind of my rantings and ramblings. Um, I do have a Twitch. I don't really talk about spooky stuff on there. I might. Uh, I've been trying to figure out ways to do so. But I'm not really sure how to do it live with the amount of research that I do and the organization of the thoughts. I, it was suggested to me to just go live on Twitch while I do my research and talk to people about the stuff I find as I find it. But I'm not sure if that would actually be entertaining because it would be a lot of me going... I don't know if you can hear my clickety-clack, but it's me typing. It would be like... What? Click, click, open new Word document, click, click, click. I don't know. It seems like it would be boring. And also, I like to have, like, eight different things making noise at me while I research. Because my brain can only focus when there are three different types of chaos going on at the same time. And I don't know. But I'd be willing to try if you guys were interested in it. And if you wanted to, like, go in and watch me and ask me questions... Since I am a professional researcher, I can look up stuff for you if you don't know how to look it up right. I don't know. If you have ideas for, for stuff that I could do on Twitch, if you wanted to watch me live, let me know that. So, references will be in the description. And I'll be on Patreon with extra sources that I didn't end up using. Wait, I already did that. I did that already. <laughs> I got a full list of resources on there, including the ones that I did not use for my actual video. Um, yeah. Um, fucking, hopefully it won't be this long before I upload again. And later, nerds. I have a piece of paper. I've also got a piece of paper right here. 
And I will be thanking my patrons and supporters. I would first like to thank Nikki and I think Rachel for, I bu- because I believe that you guys support me on Anchor, I think. I haven't checked this month, <laughs> but you have before and I thank you. And uh, uh, my patrons, Dale, Walter Fate, uh, you make me do this, five-time heavyweight champion Patrick the Breezy P. Finnegan, <laughs> Hair Nile, Hair Nile, Nile, wow, usually I'm good at pronouncing, so you know who you are, <laughs> Brent Hester, Duncan Idaho, and Matty. And to everyone else who has been a patron before but was unable to continue, I appreciate you all. Appreciate you all. Thank you for being the greatest nerds in all the land.